Why are there different readings in the various translations? The King James Version came out originally in 1611. That's a long time ago, over 400 years, isn't it? There were not very many new translations until the 1950s. And folks, since the 1950s, there has been what one man referred to as a proliferation of new translations. There are so many out there that guess what? You can't even keep up with them. Somebody got a new version, you ask them, what are you reading from? They'll tell you, I never heard of that before. And even if you could keep up with them, and you went out to try to buy one, you'd be in a poorhouse. There's so many of them. I'd have to have a whole new library. There's so many of them. But every one of us have experienced this particular problem, haven't we? When translations are read in Bible class or wherever we might be, one person will read something and we'll be looking at our Bibles and we'll say, well, that's not what my Bible says. Or somebody will make a point, a teacher, a preacher will make a point. He'll get somebody to quote the verse regarding that point and guess what? When he reads the verse, it doesn't make the point. Oh, are you kidding me? So the person wants to know, why are there all these differences? Well, let's look at a couple of things very quickly first. The words can be different in translations, can't they? In Philippians 2 verse 6, the King James Version reads as follows, Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now, in order to understand that, we've got to do a little bit of study, don't we? But if someone has the English Standard Version, here's what it says. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Doesn't read like the other one at all, does it? Thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Thought not equality with God something to be grasped. So sometimes words are different. How about this one? There's occasions when they flip-flop the order of the words in a verse. You turn to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, and Peter writes this, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. I pick up the English Standard Version and it says this, Concerning this salvation, the prophets who have prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully. There's a little bit of word change. There is also a reversal in the order as to how the verse reads, isn't there? It's not a big deal, but there is a reversal. If you're trying to follow along, if you're trying to follow me in the King James Version, or I'm trying to follow you, and I've got a King James Version, you have the ESV, then I'm going to get a little mixed up because it flip-flops two phrases. Sometimes words, sometimes phrases, sometimes entire verses are omitted, aren't they? When you turn to the... King James Version to Acts 8 verse 37, you're going to find the entire verse is there. The eunuch desired to be baptized, and the Bible says, Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. Folks, that verse is not in the English Standard Version. It's not in many of the modern versions. The number is there. A star might be beside the number, and in the bottom there's a footnote explaining why this verse has been omitted. But if an individual is just reading the text, and you're reading along with him in the King James Version, he will just skip verse 37 because it isn't there. And that's not something that is uncommon with regard to many of the new translations. Again... The questioner wants to know why. Why are there these differences? I'm going to give you three reasons 
as to why these differences exist. Number one, the translators oftentimes are translating from different texts. Now you're going to have to get your thinking caps on, and it's early, okay? There are 5,700 manuscripts of the New Testament alone, folks. 5,700. In other words, they are copies of the original documents. We don't have any originals. All we have are copies. But we have 5,000. 700 of them. It is the most well-attested book in the entirety of the world, folks. Just underline that. God has preserved His Word for us. Now, those 5,700 manuscripts fall into three categories. Most of the time, they were referred to as three different traditions. In other words, what they're saying is this. Some of these manuscripts were found in this area. Some of these manuscripts were found in this area. And some of these manuscripts were found in this area. So there's three different traditions. Number one, the Alexandrian tradition. It is said that the Alexandrian manuscripts contain the oldest manuscripts that are available. You'll hear such things as the Sinaiticus or the Vaticanus manuscripts. These are the most brief of all the manuscripts that exist. There's another line. They're referred to as the Byzantine tradition. The bulk of the manuscripts that we possess fall into the category of the Byzantine manuscripts. In those particular manuscripts, many of the difficult problems and passages were tried to be solved by those who were making the copies. Trying to make them easier to read, more meaningful to read. We also have what is known as the Western manuscripts. These include not only the Greek manuscripts, they also include Latin manuscripts and the writings of the church fathers, that is... Elders, deacons, preachers, church leaders who wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th centuries. Those individuals are the most paraphrased manuscripts that exist. So you've got three traditions. 5,700 manuscripts, three different groups into which those manuscripts fall. Now they've taken all of those writings... And they have produced what are referred to as Greek texts. And you can order any one of these Greek texts online. One of them is called the Novum Testimum Grace. It is also referred to as the Nessel Allen Text. Another is referred to as the Greek New Testament of the United Bible Society. Now remember, if you order these texts, they're all in Greek. You're not going to be able to read them unless you know Greek. Another one is this. The Society of Biblical Literature, Greek New Testament. And a fourth one is referred to as the Textus Receptus. Now most of the Bibles that we have in existence are translated from these particular Greek texts. Now here's something you need to understand. When a translator translates, he can only translate what is written in the text that he is translating. Isn't that true? If I have a Greek word here, I can translate it. If there is no Greek word here, then guess what? You don't just make something up. You just can't translate that. If something is not there, then guess what they have to do? They have to omit it. Now, this process is called textual criticism. And it's been going on now for hundreds of years, hasn't it? 
And so all these individuals know the differences between this group of text and that group of text and this group of text. And therefore, when they come together and they're going to make a brand new version, there may be 50, 60, 100 different translators, and they finally get to one of these places where there is what is referred to as a textual variant. The verse isn't there. It's doubtful whether it should be. Should we include it? Should we not include it? Does it need to be another word? What do we need to do? Folks, it's at that point that they have to make a decision as translators. And when they do, they footnote their decision in the biblical text most of the time. Not always, but most of the time. Like I said, if you've got a version that doesn't have Acts 8.37 there, they'll have a note in the footnote. They may even quote the entire verse in that footnote, but tell you why it's not there. Now another thing they do is this. Sometimes they just separate one part of the text from the rest of the text. You're reading Mark the 16th chapter. And you're going down through there and you get to act, uh, Mark 16 verse 8, everything's fine, all the texts read almost exactly the same. And then all of a sudden, in your version, there's this big gap between verses 8 and verse 9. And in that gap, there are these words that are said, the oldest manuscripts do not include Mark 16, 9 through 20. The oldest manuscripts, the Alexandrian manuscripts, the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus do not contain the text. And so they put this big gap there and they'll tell you that the oldest manuscripts don't have them. And then they continue verses 9 through 16 in the text. You're going, that's kind of weird, isn't it? It either should be there or it shouldn't be there. If it shouldn't be there, then what? Get rid of it. If it should be there, then what? Keep it. But that's not what they do. They just cast doubt. And people like us who haven't studied a whole lot, who don't know a lot about textual criticism, it can cause us some problems, can it not? And how many of you are going to spend 10, 12, 20, 40, 100 hours studying this stuff? Yeah, Beverly laughed. She said, and I'm not. Now here's something that's interesting. The main Greek New Testament texts use the New Testament studies that are eclectic. What they mean by that is this. They don't just look at one text. They try to look at all the texts or as many of the texts as possible. In fact, they try to look at all 5,700 texts that are out there. That is, in their finalized form, they are compositions of various readings from a variety of manuscripts as opposed to being equivalent to one complete New Testament manuscript. Because the texts of various manuscripts differ at points, these points are known as variants. Methods are used to conclude which reading is most likely the original one. This process of determining the most likely reading is known as textual criticism. I've been using Acts 8.37. They get to that particular point. Some texts have it, some texts don't. So the translators have to ask themselves the question, does it belong in the text or doesn't it? And that is a, te that is a translator's decision to do that, folks. Okay? Based on the texts that are out there. So that's one reason we have all these differences is because different texts are being used by different translators. Another reason is this. Sometimes the translators... Just use different words that mean exactly the same thing, don't they? Ephesians 1 verse 7, King James Version says this, In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. The English Standard Version says this, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the what? The forgiveness of our trespasses according to to the riches of His grace. One version says we are forgiven of what? Sin. The other one says we are forgiven of trespasses. Are those two words synonymous? Not strictly speaking, but as far as sin and iniquity is concerned, they mean exactly the same thing. The violation of God's law. 
But if you're reading along and you're, you've got one version, you're going to hear another word, aren't you? That's different from the word that's in your Bible. Now, there, here's where this caused problems for preachers and for teachers sometimes. Because there's times when I pick up a Bible and it says something, and you want to know what I'm going to do? I'm going to quote that verse, and I want it to make a point. I want it to strike home. It happened the other day in ladies' Bible class. There's a passage there, Habakkuk 1, verse 4, and I thought it's a wonderful, wonderful statement that's in Habakkuk 1, verse 4. I said, y'all turn there and listen to what this verse says. And it says this, Therefore, the law is slacked. Isn't that a wonderful thought? I could preach all day on that. The law is slacked. Rather than keeping the law specifically, rather than keeping the law the way it should be, correctly, rightly, these individuals were slack in their law keeping. That's not going on anywhere, is it? It's going on everywhere today. But, when you look at it in other translations, the law is paralyzed. How about this one? Therefore the law is powerless. Therefore the law is ignored. This is why the law is ineffective. The law is weak and useless. Therefore law ceases. Here I am trying to make a point. There's six or seven other translations out there, and guess what? They don't make my point. And somebody's going to raise their hand, and you want to know what they're going to say? Preacher! That ain't what my Bible says. And guess what happens? I can't make my point, and now we have to discuss what? The differences in translations. Ugh. Drives you crazy. Just drives you bonkers. But it happens all the time. Reason number three. Folks, there are translators who when they translate, they are not honest. We need to understand that. And sometimes they put their thoughts and sometimes they put their teachings into the Word of God. In Romans 3 verse 28, the Bible reads as follows, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith, Without the deeds of the law. Is that a true statement? Yes. We are justified by faith. Martin Luther, however, reacted in such a way to the work salvation of Roman Catholicism that he believed in the doctrine of faith only. When he made his translation of the Scripture, here's the way he translated Romans 3.28. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith only without the deeds of the law. Folks, that little word only is not in the Greek text. Martin Luther put it there because that's what he wanted it to teach. We are justified by faith. We are never justified by faith only. You see, Martin Luther's view was injected into the text of Scripture. And you don't think men can do that today? Absolutely they can. Turn to Psalm 51 verse 5. Psalm 51 5 in the King James Version says this, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Here's the NIV, the New International Version. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Because that passage teaches what? Original sin, does it not? Or total depravity. David said what? I was sinful at birth. Is that true? Were you sinful at birth? When you were conceived in your mother's womb, were you sinful at that very moment? That's what the Bible says in the NIV. So guess what I have to do? I have to stop and say, that ain't right. And then guess what I've just done? I've cast doubt on the Bible, right? What else in this book's not right? That's not good. What else am I going to have to fix? So sometimes translators are not honest. They want to inject into the text things that shouldn't be there, and that makes for different renderings of the text. Here's an important consideration, okay? Because of the number of versions that exist and all the variant readings that are out there, 
It is wise for an eldership to limit what versions can be used from the pulpit and in the classroom. I've got no problem with an eldership doing that, folks. That's part of their responsibility, is it not? And even then, if we only have three or four translations that are used, even then, there can still be some problems that will develop in Bible class over those versions that we'll have to deal with and talk about because there are differences between them. Sometimes they're not that big, and sometimes they are. But elders need to make those decisions.